Hey everybody, this is Mr. Tucker. Um, I'm going to record this lecture for us. Normally this is a lecture I like to give uh, the first week of school when we're together, but for the sake of time this year and the setting we're in, um, I figured it would be easier to record this video and then let you watch it on your own. So uh, this is just basically my introductory lecture on what is history. Uh, what are we studying? How are we going to do it? So here's the outline for this lecture. We're going to cover some myths about history. We're going to look at why we study history. Uh, we're going to look at the different types of history uh, or some of the different types of history and then um, talk about some best practices for history students in this class. Okay. So first of all, the first myth we're going to cover is history is just about memorizing a bunch of dates and dead people. Right, that's all we have to do. We just memorize this list of events and then all these people who are dead and I don't really know why I'm talking about them. Um, that is a common perception and this is just totally busted. Right, history is about so much more than just memorizing these names and these dates. History is about uh, the studying the impact of people, their stories, the way that they have shaped society, the way that events have shaped the outcomes of society, and tracing that impact to our present day, right? Looking at how the decisions made in the 1940s and 50s are still affecting us today, right? That is why we study history, and we study history to validate and give value to the individual story, right? We want to look at the impact people have made both in the, the people that we always talk about, uh, but then also the people that we don't talk about. Uh, we want to make sure that we are giving room for people's stories and really tracing their impact. The next myth is that history hasn't changed and can't change, so there's no reason to study it, right? The past is the past, um, however you want to say it. This myth, I'm going to say, is plausible. And here we go, this is why. Number one, on the one hand, you're right. The past has not changed. We don't have a time machine. We can't go fix things, right? We can't go change things. Um, but what has changed is the amount of information we have, right? When your parents and guardians were in school, even when I was in school, and I'm not that much older than you, um, there are documents, there are resources, there are archaeological sites that we did not know about, that we've discovered since then. And all of that information, all of that evidence helps us build a more complete picture of the past. So the, his, the, the, the past has not changed. What has changed is the information we have access to, right? And when we know better, we ought to do better. So if we have this information, we need to update what we know or what we thought we knew based on the evidence in front of us. We can't just ignore evidence because it doesn't fit what we've always talked about, okay? So there's that myth. The last myth I want to look at is this myth that history repeats itself. Uh, there's a famous quote, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't, uh, but those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And that's from Santayana, he was a, um, a well-known military leader, both in Mexico and then in uh, the North American, what today would be the North the United States territories. Um, and this, this myth is just absolutely impossible. Um, history cannot repeat itself. To say that history repeats itself is to say that the lived experience of people doesn't matter, doesn't change anything, and, and doesn't have an impact, right? To say that World War II is just a repeat of World War I is to deny the existence and deny the suffering of hundreds of thousands of European Jews, uh, European Romani people, uh, those who were, you know, socially, uh, religiously, uh, whether they were different from the mainstream, it's to deny their experience, right? All of the factors, all of the choices, all of the stories that existed get ignored if you just say, oh, World War II is a repeat of World War I, or, oh, we're just living a repeat of this. History doesn't repeat itself. There are certainly patterns, and we can recognize those patterns, and we can recognize, you know, maybe some possible outcomes, but to say that history repeats itself is to remove all of the individual people, you and me, from the story, and that we cannot, we simply cannot do that, okay? Um, so the purpose of studying history. There's a video I would normally show you. I'm just going to link to it 
Um, it might start to play here. We'll, we'll kind of ignore it. Maybe I'll try and cut it out of the recording. Um, it's a funny video, right? But we're more interested in the takeaways from it, and I don't want to, this video to be super long, so uh, we're going to skip that slide. But here we go. Some big ideas from the video, some big takeaways that we would get from the video um, is that basically if I teach, if all I teach you is information you can find on Google, then I have not taught you history. I've prepared you for Jeopardy. And my job is not to prepare you for Jeopardy. It's to make you better citizens, more better informed citizens so that you can go out and impact your community for the better. Right. I'm here to make better people. Right. I'm here to educate you and uplift you and teach you not prepare you for a game show or teach you something that you could have just Googled uh, faster than I can explain it, right? The other thing that the big takeaway is that context matters, right? Dates, names, and events, they mean nothing without surrounding details. If, if I just tell you the name Thomas Jefferson, it means his name may mean nothing to you without context, right? But if you start to if you start knowing more about him, you know that he's the third president, you know that he wrote the Declaration of Independence, you know that he was a slave owner from Virginia who fought hard uh, against um, the initial constitution and, and the potential uh, that uh, potential decisions early on to try and eliminate slavery. He fought vehemently against those. Um, the context matters. Who these people are matters. The details matters. Uh, matters. Excuse me. Uh, we can learn from the past to avoid making similar mistakes, right, in the future. And that's a future that you are going to be integral in shaping, right? You are uh, probably a year, maybe a year and a half away from being able to vote. That is a major civil responsi responsibility that I hope you engage with. I hope you take it seriously. Um, but we need to learn what's happened so we can avoid repeating mistakes, right? Not that history repeats, but learn our lessons from the past so that we avoid similar situations, right? If you look around the world and you don't like what you see or you don't like certain aspects and you want the world to change, you're going to have to be the one that changes it, right? It's not, somebody else is not going to do it for you. You have to be part of the change. You have to speak up, act up, and be part of that change. Again, we want to do that uh, civilly, we want to do that in respect of laws and in respect of society. But if it's going to happen, it's going to be you. And so shouldn't you be as informed as possible about the things that have happened before your time, right? The other thing is learning other people's stories fosters a greater empathy. Empathy is being able to sit with somebody and, and say, hey, I recognize the emotions you're feeling. I recognize how this is impacting you. I may not personally have experienced it. I may not know exactly what it feels like, but I can be here with you and I can recognize your uh, suffering or your hardship. History is about reading, writing, analyzing, and thinking critically about the past and tracing that impact to our modern era. We've talked about that, but be ready. In this class, we're going to read, we're going to write, and I need you to think critically. It's not, questions in history are not just a simple yes or no. A word of caution, however, we want to trace the impact of to our present time, right? We want to look at the way events have, have impacted us, but we can't apply present beliefs, ideas, or values to the past. Case in point, we would all agree today that slavery or uh, Jim Crow laws, or any sort of discrimination based on somebody's ethnicity, somebody's gender, somebody's um, social orientation, right? We would agree today, by, by today's values, that that's wrong, that we need to value people as people, right? But when we study the past, we're not going to see that. We already know that things like slavery and bigotry and sexism have been prevalent in our history. And so that's not to go in and say that, oh, it was, it was, it was okay then and now it's wrong. No, we can say confidently that, that slavery or uh, discriminating, keeping women from being able to vote, keeping uh, minority, ethnic minorities from being able to vote, we can confidently say that's wrong. But it's our job to go in and look at why the people believe that or practice that, right? We want to get to their motivation so we can understand why they did the things they did, which will help us better understand those events and then how they've 
gone forward to impact us today, right? So it's 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 never enough to go in and say, well, because we believe this today, therefore it was this way back then. We can't do that. We have to study the past and have to understand their motives and their beliefs in the present time, in their present time, so that we can better understand them and what's happening. We'll go over that later uh, in more depth. But the other thing is that the events that have shaped the world are rarely, if ever, plain or clear cut, or another way of saying that is things are rarely black and white. There is what is called nuance. And, and nuance is the reality of history. It means things are rarely simple, right? There are usually multiple sides to every argument. There's usually multiple viewpoints to every uh, every event. So to simply boil something down in history and say, this is bad, is, is not enough. We need to critically analyze something and say why it's bad, who it's bad for, uh, who benefits from it, but ultimately who is suffering, or why it's good, who's benefiting, and, and maybe you know who's not benefiting as much, right? It's, it's about nuance. Next up, we're going to look at types of history. Um, and the reason we're going to do this is because there is no such thing as just one giant definition of history, right? Uh, there are many different types of history and many different ways to study history. When you study history in uh, elementary school, middle school, and high school, generally speaking, we teach all of these different histories lumped together in one class. But if you ever study history outside of grade school, if you go into college and you take classes, um, what you'll find is those classes are very specific most of the time. Um, and it's important to know what types of history there are because many students say I don't like history it's boring or whatever but maybe you just don't like certain types of history right or maybe you don't like certain topics but you like other ones so let's look at it the other thing you'll notice is on these next few slides I'm going to introduce the type of history and I'm also going to show you uh, some historians that are that are active in these fields of history or in the case of one of them the founder of one of those schools of thought um, and for the most part these examples are local these are people you have access to um, right here in the valley they're at fresno state they're you know five minutes away from campus here uh, and they're doing this work they're published authors uh, that other students are reading around the world so let's dive into it first of all there's political history political history is the history or the story of government political leaders, electoral activities, and the making of policy and the interaction between the branches of government, right? So it's studying uh, politics. It's studying government relationships internally, right? Um, and so the uh, chair of the history department at Fresno State, Dr. William Scubin, uh, he is a political historian. He studies primarily uh, political history in Latin America, looking mostly at uh, ch uh, Chile and Peru. Um, but he is a political historian. He's looking at the role of government and political leaders or in elections, policy making. He's looking at those relationships and that, trans that, that change over time. As opposed to somebody like Dr. Lori Kloon, who's also at Fresno State, she is a Cold War historian. She studies primarily diplomatic history, the study of relationships between nations, right? The, the, the relationship that the United States has to say Cuba or the history, the, the, the relationship the United States has to uh, the so former Soviet Union or Russia today, right? She's interested in those diplomatic relationships. So not the internal relationships of the nation, but those relationships abroad. Then there's social history. Social history is the study of uh, ways and customs of family, education, children, demography, which is population change. Uh, and voluntary institutions like the church. It's the, it's the study of how those institutions shape us, change us, and change society, right? Dr. Carter G. Woodson's considered the father of social history. Uh, this is a pretty popular type of history, right? Um, and one that may excite you. You may not like any other history, but you may like studying the way that certain family values have shaped different areas or different people. Then there's cultural history. It's the study of language and its uses, or of the arts and literature and sports, entertainment, and memory in constructing cultural categories. Uh, again, from Fresno State, Dr. Ethan Keitel and his wife, Dr. Blaine Roberts, uh, they study, they, their most recent work is Denmark Vesey's Garden. Uh, it's a book on the memory of slavery in the Confederacy, in the cradle of the Confederacy, as they put it. So they're tracing the memory 
of slavery and the role of slavery and the memory of that uh, in the lives of people as it has shaped the South, looking at Reconstruction up to even the present. The last two that we're going to talk about uh, is economic history, right? So it's the study of how an entire system of production and consumption works or of markets, industry, credit, right? It's looking at money. It's looking at the way money and markets uh, influence society and have caused change over time. And then there's intellectual history, right? So it's the study of ideologies or epistemologies. It's analyzing how an idea affects human actions, right? So how people's beliefs or an idea has trans transformed history, right? The last one that I, I don't have a slide for because I think it's one we're, we're pretty familiar with. It's military history. It's what a lot of people think of. When you turn on the History Channel and it's a never-ending uh, you know, documentary on World War II followed immediately by a never-ending documentary on World War I, a wash, rinse, repeat over and over and over again, right? We're very familiar with military history. It's the, the history of studying troop movements and battle scenarios and strategies, right? It's not my favorite type of history, right? And so that's what I hope you find is that history is not just one thing. I don't love studying military history, but I love studying cultural history. I love studying political history. I love studying the stories involved by, by to get those, to make up those histories, right? The people involved in those stories. But I don't love military history. You may love economic history. You may love looking at the way that business and markets have shaped the world. That may be what you love. And so I would hate for you to ever think, I hate history, when really what it is is you love economic history. You're just not a big fan of everything else. And that's fine. You can specialize. You can find the thing you like. All right, so some best practices for you as historians in my class. I'm not going to read all of these. Some of these we went over with the syllabus, but I'm going to hit on a few key things. Number one, um, remember, this is a partnership, right? I'm, I'm learning alongside of you. If I'm asking you to read something, just trust me. I've read it at least once, probably twice, if not more. Um, and so when I ask you to be prepared and to participate, believe you me, I'm putting in the work as well. The next one I want to hit really is this this big idea down here, this agree with class, disagree with dignity, right? In Clovis, we say win with class, lose with dignity. In my class, we're going to say agree with class, disagree with dignity. We might have disagreements. We might have arguments, and that's okay. We don't have to agree at the end of the day. We don't all have to think the same thing. But when we disagree, we're going to disagree with dignity. We're not going to tear each other down or belittle each other. We're going to respect one another as fellow scholars. Okay, and when we argue, we are going to remove the emotion from our argument. In history, um, something you never want to lead with is, I feel this, right? Um, your feelings are valid, and we validate your feelings. But when we are citing things in history, when we're making arguments in history, we have to remove the emotion from it, right? We have to cite evidence. We have to prove what we're saying. We have to have evidence. We need to say, uh, you know, I know this to be true because, or based on what I read, or the author states here, right, according to the text, or according to this, right, um, we need evidence to prove what we're saying, not just that we feel strongly about that thing, okay? All right, last couple things here. Uh, we'll talk more about vocab, specifically um, as a class together outside of this presentation. But just so you know, um, I, when I say the term IDs, if I say we're going to ID something, that's basically vocabulary, right? And I'm looking for the who, what, where, when, why, and so what. I'm really looking for that so what. Why do we care? Why did I bother to study this? Why did I bother to ask you to do this? Why is this event or this person important enough that we're talking about them, right? That's what I'm really concerned about. If you can tell me the who, what, where, when, why, that tells me that you're at least in the ballpark, right? You at least have an idea of what this thing is. But if you can tell me the so what, then I know that you got it. I know that you understand what's happening, okay? Um, and then in this class, when we write dates, okay, this is just a little pro tip for you, right? Um, in world history, you can usually get away with identifying the century, right? We, the world history covers the scope of thousands and thousands of years. And so to simply say, oh, in the fourth century, right, is usually okay. You usually get away with that. 
the United States has only been around for 244 years. So we have to be a little more specific with our dates, right? It's a little, it's way more common to, for you to say in 1966 or from 1960 to 1965, right? Um, that is going to be important. At the, if you can't give me specific years, then you at least need to be in the correct decade, right? So maybe uh, when you're describing something, you don't remember the exact year, but you know it was in the 1960s. So then you would say in the 1960s, right? Um, and then we're absolute worst case scenario, if you don't remember the exact year and you don't remember the, the decade, um, maybe you remember that it happened sometime during Abraham Lincoln's presidency, right? So you tell me, you know, during the Lincoln presidency, um, or maybe you remember it happened, uh, you know, during World War II, so you might say during World War II, right, give me context, but you need to give context for time. We need to give context for when things are happening. And in U.S. history, that usually means a specific date, but again, if you can't remember the specific date, there are options, okay? All right, so that is this presentation. Again, we'll talk about this a little bit as a class. I want you to watch this on your own um, and, and just have an idea, but if you have questions, please contact me. Um, if something doesn't make sense, please contact me. Um, but I'm looking forward to this year. I'm looking forward to our journey, and I'm looking forward to really bringing history alive for you. That's my goal. That's what I, I love this topic. I love bringing it to, to people um, and sharing it with young people. And my goal is to get you excited about history. You may not, it may not be your favorite subject by the end of the year, but I'm hoping to get it to at least something that you enjoy, right? It doesn't have to be your favorite. I'm just hoping you don't hate it by the end of the year. All right. Thanks so much.